Hello, welcome to another episode of Hot Routes. Matthew Collar along with Jonathan Harrison here. And Jonathan, another crazy week in the National Football League in which we saw the Super Bowl between the Buffalo Bills and the Kansas City Chiefs. And my gosh, those football teams are good. And it was such a glorious experience. And then, heck, even Philadelphia and Dallas, the best of the AFC, the best of the NFC. And then Monday Night Football came along and punched us all in the face <laughs> 43 times over and over and went to overtime because there's no mercy that the NFL cannot rain down bad football upon us. And please folks do your eyeballs a favor and do not look at next week's matchups. It is a hideous, hideous slate of football games. And as much as we love it, Jonathan, as much as we put so much heart and passion into our coverage, it just has to be said, this is the ugliest year of national football league football that we have seen in a very long time, my friend. Absolutely. But how does it also come with the year that we have the closest score lines among the entire league at this point? So the games are more exciting, but it's just not probably in a good way because it's just a ton of bad football. You love to see the exciting games. You just wish it was, it looked better while we were doing it. Cause it's just, yeah, some of this stuff is really bad. Going back to the Tom Brady quote, there's just a lot of bad football. And I know a lot of people have been saying that for quite a few years now. Well, Tom Brady doesn't want to play anymore and compared playing. I thought this was the onion, but yeah. he compared playing to being deployed with the military. What? No, you don't <laughs> like, do that, man. That's maybe you could say like working in another state like that. <laughs> do you? But man, I don't think you oh. want to make that comparison because uh, I think that that's pretty offensive to all of those wonderful people who serve and don't just get to fly home on a Wednesday if they want to. My gosh, man, or whatever it is. I remember hearing the story of Gus Farratt when he was late in his career. After the game, he would fly back home and stay home literally until Wednesday. He would like get the game plan, yeah. get, you know, whatever emailed to him or something because he was 38 and who cares? And he was a backup. So that was part of the deal. And Tom Brady could do that too. He's been taking time off left and right. You know, if you're deployed in Japan or something that you can't do that. I just like the one to randomly take 12 days off during basic training. I don't think that's how it works. I don't think your military instructors would be okay with that. What, what an offensive and absurd <laughs> and preposterous comparison. I mean, I get, I get it. The guy seems to have his marriage troubles or whatever else. He's probably pretty upset, but just like, like, like just tell us that you have no perspective whatsoever on the world without telling us you have no perspective whatsoever on the world. My gosh. So thanks for that, uh, Tom Brady, but he was right that there's been a lot of bad football and a lot. Of, I mean, heck the close games are caused because no one's scoring. I saw that like the, the top graded quarterbacks of this last week, Two of them were like Mariota and Trubisky. E. That's how bad it is. <laughs> oh, goodness. And, and Wilson versus Herbert is two injured quarterbacks going up against each other with, uh, let's see, Herbert didn't have his top receiver. The left tackle for the Broncos is hurt. Uh, Wilson's got a shoulder injury and a hamstring injury. I mean, it's uh, that's been a major part of it, don't you think? Is just the number of quarterbacks who have been hurt is kind of through the roof. And now Carson Wentz is out as well. And it's not like Wentz is great, but he threw like 30-something touchdowns last year, and now they have to go to Taylor Heineke. Yeah, it's, it, it feels like we're going back to the 2017 season when literally all the quarterbacks felt like they were injured or were injured. I mean, you had Aaron Rodgers down that season early on, and a bunch of other quarterbacks go down as well. And you saw how that kind of season played out. I mean, Jacksonville got to the AFC championship game that season and were very close, if I remember correctly, to beating the Patriots for a chance to go to the Super Bowl. And so, yeah, things like that, when these quarterbacks go down, you understand why some of these rush or roughing the passer calls get called. Like, yeah, you may not like it, but these quarterbacks are protected because if you don't have them, there's a lot of bad football and it's showing lately. Yeah. And there was a bad one on Russell Wilson where he hits him in the hip and it's just like, I don't know what he's supposed to do. Right. Uh, I, I stand very much on the side of protecting quarterbacks, but you also have an obligation to get those right. Like to mm -hmm. that, 
that if re- that if referees are getting them wrong, it's really impacting games. So it has to be super specific on what that's supposed to be. You can't have a, a guy steal the ball away from the other quarterback and then get called for it. And then the same guy kicks Josh Allen and sacks him with a kick and is not called. So I just want them to get that right. I don't know if it's the angles or the number of people looking at it or the lack of a sky judge. But uh, yeah, that's a problem. So we've got hot routes to get to here. And why don't we dive right into those? Uh, First question for you, Jonathan, the New York Jets and New York Giants are winning ball clubs. How about that? The world is better when the Jets and Giants are playing well, I guess. Uh, Anyway, it's been a while since both of these teams were good. I didn't take the time to look up when exactly they were both good, but it was probably during the Eli Manning era, Rex Ryan. I don't know if that crossed over. Anyway, that's not the point. I don't care about that. (laughs) Let's talk about, first of all, some great Jets or Giants, your favorite Jets or Giants ever. And then we'll get to whether we're buying the Jets and the Giants. So give me your favorite Jets or Giants or Jet Giants. I don't think I have any Jet Giants. You may be able to correct me on this. Uh, I'm going to start off with the obvious one, Darrell Revis. I love I love lockdown corners. They bring an added element to a defense that just kind of changes how things go and quarterbacks can't throw, couldn't literally couldn't throw it at Darrell Rivas. Otherwise he'd knock it down or pick it off. And it, it, it was amazing to see the fear that one cornerback could have or could instill in, in an offense. And so I loved watching him play and watching those defenses play going back a little bit. Wayne Krebet. Yeah. He's it, he played a very physical style as a wide receiver and kind of left his mark on the game that way. And He's a lot worse off for it, and you don't like seeing that part of it. But the undrafted status of him and making a career as long as he did out of being an undrafted guy, you always love to see those kind of stories. Jeremy Shockey, for me, being a University of Miami fan back in my high school days and seeing him come out of there and uh, making a career as kind of, he, he kind of felt like the first of a breed of tight ends that we started to see, these super athletic guys that came out and started uh, – started playing very big time. You had Antonio Gates at the time as well. And I love seeing those guys. Another one for me from the Giants, and I have a story about this from the London trip, Ozzy Uminyora. He does he does football TV over in England. I think he's on like Sky Sports or something over there. And there was a NFL show or something on Sky Sports one night that I was just watching because it was just on. I'm like, let's see how they talk about it over here. And he dropped the line. I was one of the greatest defensive defensive ends in the history of this game. And I'm like, were you though? Were you though, Ozzy? I don't think you were. I mean, he's pretty good. <laughs> he's pretty like, good, but depends on how far you want to stretch that out. <laughs> I mean, it would be like saying, uh, like, I don't know. The guitar player from fallout boy is one of the best <laughs> guitar players ever. Now, technically speaking, I bet that guy is in the like 99th percentile of all guitar players. I'm sure yeah. he's fantastic, but he's not like the guy from Pink Floyd or something. You know what I mean? Like he's like really good. That's like OCU Manura. Like, yeah, he's a really good player. One of the greatest ever, not going to put on a gold jacket, but also <laughs> think about how many dudes are like you and me, just like average people who can barely like, stand up and walk through the house without our heart rate going up. I mean, this guy, this guy was sacking people for a long time. I'll give it to him. I'll give it to him. Okay. I, it took me by surprise when he said, I'm like, Oh, okay. I guess we're going there today. Aren't we? Cool player. Why not? (laughs) Yeah. It's part of some good defensive lines, but it's a bit of a stretch, but we'll take it here this time. Uh, And then lastly, David Tyree, just for the catch alone. That's it. That's, that's why I put him on this list because the catch, he stopped an undefeated season from happening. So I will put him on my list just for that reason. I like it. I like it. Wayne Corbett. I mean, what a, what a player, right? I mean, one of the original little slot receivers going to make it plays over the middle of the field. But when the game was much more physical, as you mentioned, uh, I really thought he was an engine to those offenses for the jets. By the way, I do have the answer. I was just messing around. The answer is Oh six is when the last time the jets and giants were both in the playoffs. I think if I, my research is correct, it's 2006 and uh, the jets were 10 and six and the giants were eight and eight. So that was, that was the last time. It's been a long time. Uh, I will give you mine. One is a crossover jet giant 
which is Jumbo Elliott. Jumbo Elliott, first of all, his name is Jumbo Elliott. He's an offensive and played, lineman. And he played for the Jets and the Giants. You couldn't have a more perfect name for a Jet Giant other than I know. Jumbo. And he only played for the Jets and Giants. That's one of the cool things about him is that like he wasn't a journeyman. He just didn't want to move. I mean, this this guy had a, a Manhattan apartment and he was not changing it. Or in New Jersey, I guess. He played for the Giants from 88 to 95 and was a monster and then played from uh, 96 to 2002 as a Jet. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, I'm going to try to catch. Yeah, that's right. He scored a touchdown one time. This guy, oh, this guy was six foot seven, well over 300 pounds and caught a touchdown pass from Vinny Testaverde. <laughs> That's a legend right there. Won a Absolute. Super Bowl. Just what a beast. Jumbo Elliott. First Throw pick. the gold jacket on him just for that. Uh, Curtis Martin. One of my favorite players ever. One of the things about running backs is that we've, because their value has gone down so significantly in recent years, we've sort of like washed out that position as mattering at all. Mm -mm. Curtis Martin was an absolute monster for both the Jets and the Patriots. And if you've ever watched his A Football Life documentary, if you haven't, go find it. It's incredible. Like the guy's story, his relationship with Bill Parcells uh, when they were with the Patriots, obviously. And even it was interesting about him leaving and becoming a New York jet. Uh, so yeah, just super fascinating stuff with uh, Curtis Martin, but one of those guys that was just a warrior, like this unstoppable force type of player who just kept pounding away at teams, shredding tackles, breaking big runs. Like back in the day when running backs were the center of a lot of offenses, Curtis Martin was the coolest. Uh, Lavernius Coles underrated and, and look Madden 90 something speed, put Lavernius Coles in the slot, run that deep post, throw it up over the top. I mean, just unreal. But an underrated receiver, I think, of the area era does not get a whole ton of credit. Uh, maybe didn't play quite long enough and only made the Pro Bowl once. But, I mean, just, just had a run, though, of 89, 82, 90, 73, and 91 catches in, in a stretch there for the Jets from 2002 and, until 2006. Just a really, really excellent uh, NFL wide receiver. A great one of the great deep threats of that era. So enjoyed watching him play. Justin Tuck was just a monster. He's just a beast. I mean, you mentioned uh, OCU Manura, but I think of him and, and Justin Tuck as being the driving forces of defenses uh, that were that were that could really take over games with their defensive line. And one of the most underrated players of the era. Antrell Roll. Give Antrell Roll Absolutely. his credit. He played a big role, huh? Roll, big role in <laughs> the Giants defense going to the next level. He had played with Arizona, was a terrific safety with Arizona, got a lot of interceptions throughout his career, and then went over to the Giants, helped them win the Super Bowl, was a big addition for that team. And I just thought Antrell Roll is a really cool player. Like it sounds kind of badass, but also just like not a guy who got a lot of credit because the defensive line was so good, but he was a playmaker on the back end. So I went a little bit of jet giant gave the big man some love, a little bit of uh, old school running back and a little bit of underrated there. Yeah. I think I'm, I missed one. I, I missed a great name that I loved back in the, or back in like the mid late 2000s to Brickishaw Ferguson. Oh I yeah. I almost is, picked I think him. He's, going in the ring of honor for the Jets at some point this season. Just a fantastic name, left tackle. That is a left tackle's name if, if there ever was one. Nick Mangold yes. and DeBrickashaw Ferguson. <laughs> Jumbo Elliott. I mean, this team is amazing uh, when it comes to the offensive lineman names. That's that's fantastic. Uh, so, I mean, you could have – there's a hundred other players yeah. you could have picked. Uh, how about like all the quarterbacks that ran through those two teams that were just hilarious and hilariously bad. Yes. Um, you know, just like the Kent Graham, Dave Brown era. It's like, who's your favorite New York giant? Kurt Warner. <laughs> yeah. Kurt Warner's bad stint in New York where he was yeah. benched for Eli for a rookie Eli Manning. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing quarterback history for both of those teams. Kellen Clemens. That's my favorite. <laughs> yes. Ray Lucas. So we could go on forever. Just naming dudes, but here's the real question that it took us 10 more minutes to get to, <laughs> which is which one of these two teams will keep it going? Let's say only one, Jonathan, who would you pick? 
this was hard because it fe it feels like the Jets have the more sustainable roster, but it also feels like the Jet or the Giants have the more sustainable coaching staff. It just feels, uh, yeah, Robert Sala had a good had a great defense in San Francisco, and it seems like he's going to be able to transplant that over to New York with now with Sauce Gardner become an absolute beast as a rookie cornerback, which. What a what a what a rise he's had over the past couple of years. Uh, now being a really good uh, cornerback as a as a rookie, which is awesome to see. Uh, but I feel more comfortable with the Giants coaching staff. But also they have an incredibly tough division in the NFC East. But also so do the Jets. So it's really hard to pick either one of these teams. But I I feel more comfortable with the coaching staff being able to keep the Giants on pace, even though they don't have as good of a quarterback maybe as the Jets, even though that quarterback battle is very close between between those two right now. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, Zach Wilson probably has higher upside throughout the yeah. season, but it's not like he's played incredibly well. And Daniel Jones is just like, what the, the bar to be a winning quarterback this year. You mentioned 2017 when Bortles got there and Nick Foles. I mean, it feels similar where it's like, could Daniel Jones be the Bortles? Why not? Because... <laughs> You know, they do have an offensive in innovative mind in Brian Dable, who I've been so impressed with so far. Uh, but also they have a good defense, I think. Mm -hmm. And I think the Jets, like they've put together this good defense all of a sudden, like snap the fingers and you just got like Quinn Williams looking great and Sauce Gardner that you mentioned. So I think it's a, it's a very, very difficult one. Uh, and I want to say that it's the Jets because I think Zach Wilson can get better. But I'm not really certain about that because I also think that the NFC is still weaker. Yeah. And from a week to week basis, if you're the, the competent, well-coached team that seems to have a real identity behind Saquon Barkley, then you can win. But I think that's really the, the center of why I would pick the jets is because when you rely on your offense to be about a running back, you're just asking for that guy to get banged up as the season goes along. And if he gets injured, then your offense kind of comes apart where I think that the Jets are a little bit better at passing the football, but they kind of uh, you know are reliant on some running backs too, but they have more than one that they can go to. So I think I'm going to go with the Jets. They're di both divisions, as you said, are very difficult. And uh, I think long-term, the Jets are probably in a little bit better position because I don't know what the Giants are going to do with Daniel Jones, where I could see Zach Will uh, Wilson continue to develop. But both teams... Nice stories so far. Yeah. Good for you, New York. Finally, New York City <laughs> catches a break. <laughs> Finally, they get something going their way in in, in the sports world. It's a, a downtrodden little town in the east. <laughs> hey, it's really Rutherford, New Jersey. I, I stayed uh, in a hotel near there once. That's my Rutherford, New Jersey story. It was fine. There you go. All right. But I the thing is, we stayed there to visit New York City as okay. I'm sure every person who stayed there did. But it's not the easiest trip over to the city from New Jersey. So it's kind of interesting that they are, you know, the New York teams, but where they play for New Yorkers is not like, it's it's not like you just kind of hop on a bus and cross the New Jersey line. Like you got some work to do to get over there. So this may feel like a question that Minnesota's get Minnesotans get all the time. Like, is it always cold there? And it's like, no, we have summers. It doesn't, for someone who's never been to New York, is any trip really that easy? Yeah, I'd say no, not really. I mean, <laughs> okay. yeah, everything. It's a different kind of hassle from, say, like L.A. Now, yeah. I mean, if you're taking an easy subway trip that is relatively straightforward, where you just get on, get off, and then you're yep. where you need to be, okay, that's totally easy. Uh, and the subway system does make it manageable. But if it's not an easy subway trip, just best of luck to you. I mean, you're going to feel <laughs> right. like there's no, you'll never survive. Uh, taxis are certainly a trip. I mean, you know, the thing is that you can, you could be going like a mile and a half or three miles or something. And it could, it could take like an hour and you're just sitting in the taxi watching the meter go like, Oh my gosh, what is happening? Um, so the traffic and stuff is problematic. I, I like it more because everything is a little closer together than LA where it's so far apart and you're just on the highway stuck like in, in a, in a mountain. I'm just like, what is going on? And there's no, like no way to identify why you're stuck or if you'll ever be unstuck. Um, so those, yeah, I, I would take New York over LA from that, 
uh, from that way. It's just because there are a lot of different ways. Like there's probably a guy with a rickshaw or something you could jump in if you really need to in New York. <laughs> LA though, you got to go like over the hill and through the woods to get anywhere. Yeah. So anyway, there's everybody's LA versus New York traffic. Chicago <laughs> low key, really bad too. Anyway, that's why we live here partially. Yeah. Uh, next question for you, Jonathan, the Browns, they are two and four. Oh, what a shame it is to see the, the Browns at two and four. That is, that is too bad. So bad for them, for their fans. They, they messed with the juju, man. I mean, they Mm -hmm. just tempted the football gods to curse them forever. And they are already pretty cursed, uh, by not only trading for Deshaun Watson, but then doing the contract thing to make sure he didn't lose money over the suspension. I want you to tell me the worst karma and the best karma in the NFL presently, other than the Browns, like who's got the best and the worst karma. Well, I'll, I'll stick with the Browns here and bring in the other, one of the other jobs that I do MLS side, the, the Haslam's they own Columbus crew who generally are a pretty good team, but this year they became historically bad at blowing games after the 90th minute. So the karma for signing Deshaun Watson to that contract and trading as much as they did uh, has not just stuck with the Browns and amplified the Browns. It has seeped over into the Haslam's other business and taken over the crew. So yeah, too bad. I feel so bad for everybody involved there. Uh, I'd say worst karma is the Lions. I'm going to stick with NFC North here. They have the worst karma in all of sports. It, It just feels like... There was so much optimism for that team going into the season, and they've just been so bad. And it's like, and you can obviously place it on Dan Campbell at times, just making bad game management decisions. But it just feel you feel kind of bad at some point that it seems like they can build, they can have a plan and build things up, but then something just goes wrong out of nowhere. You got you got bad game management situations. Uh, You had Jim Caldwell there making things right for a while and doing well. And they're like, nah, we don't want you. Let's bring in this guy from the new England Patriots. Who's a psychopath. And it just, it didn't work there. It's like, can this team just not get things going in the right direction for more than one year? And it just never feels that way Uh, for the best. It's gotta be the Packers. They have the best karma right now because two generational quarterbacks in a row. That's other than the Indianapolis Colts getting Peyton Manning right into Andrew Luck unheard of you don't get that uh maybe joe montana into steve young it's it's so rare to get that but i have a theory that once aaron Rodgers leaves they will have the worst karma because the football gods just gave them two generational quarterbacks for the last 30 years and they got two super bowls out of it the football gods are gonna be pissed that (laughs) that they gave them all the blessings in the world you're the smallest market in the league and it's not even close you don't even have a real owner and we just gave you the two best quarterbacks of their generations, and you could only get two Super Bowls out of it. Good luck, Green Bay, over the next however many years the football gods decide to curse you. Well, you know, I think so. You went a little historical on there with your yeah. with your best and worst karma. It uh, maybe the football gods though gave Green Bay their great quarterbacks so they could continue to be a franchise in Green Bay because. <laughs> yes. Because if it was the magic man, Dan Majowski there, that team is moving. <laughs> oh, yeah, uh, if it's, absolutely. If it's not Brett Favre, they are the Los Angeles Packers at this moment. Yep. Um, so they probably would not have survived if that was the case. But now the NFL is just like too big. So no matter who their quarterback is, they're still going to have huge support. Mm-hmm. They've just built up a massive franchise uh, fan base because of the two quarterbacks and so forth. So now they can survive and go forth and Jordan Love can be trash. I don't know, maybe. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I was thinking about more of this year specifically okay. that teams that really tested the waters of the gods, Carolina, you mess around, you find out trade for Baker Mayfield at the last minute in a desperate attempt. You hire Matt rule. You give him all that money. They were testing the football gods when they said, we're going to bring in a college coach, which rarely works. Mm-hmm. And then we're going to bring in this college coach who's a great college recruiter and college offensive mind. We're going to let him take over the franchise, make a joke of it for several years and give him all that money. And then give him Baker Mayfield and say like, Oh yeah, this, this is an oil and water thing that will really work. Also, Kevin Stefanski deserves a lot of credit for getting anything out of Baker Mayfield uh, with the way that he looks and acts. So (laughs) Carolina, they got some bad karma going on. Washington always (laughs) and forever. 
you give your team a racist name, then you are doomed. Uh, and then you take away your good name and make it a bad name. More doom. <laughs> Daniel Snyder, doom. You yeah. got owners saying they want him out of there. He's got, he's telling people he's got dirt on the owners as if and it's the owner's to- saying, and the owner's saying they don't care. Bring it. You're gone, no. son. That who's ready for billionaire war part one going but on also, over the next couple days. Is it hard to find dirt on billionaires? Come on. No, come, come on. Come on. Come on. So there's some pretty bad karma in Washington, like <laughs> forever. Yes. Uh, let's see. As far as the good karma goes, don't understand what the city of Philadelphia did to get their team to come back this fast uh, and be good. I'm going to have to look into that one. I don't know. Like when you, you talk about like Buffalo it certainly has it going on. They're the best team in the league and they went through so much to get here. Um, it was like, you talk about a team that was cursed. I mean, JP Lossman and Trent Edwards and Kelly Holcomb and Tyrod Taylor and just like this mess of quarterbacks, Ryan Fitzpatrick over the years. And now they have just got a Greek God as their quarterback (laughs) who cannot be stopped. And you feel really good for the people. I was thinking about this as uh, I'm going to cover a game in Buffalo in November. How many people are in their twenties who have never seen anything like this? who just never in the history of being Buffalonians have ever had a chance at this exciting of a time. That's pretty good. Uh, San Francisco keeping Jimmy Garoppolo. And I know they lost. It's a bad L, but keeping Jimmy Garoppolo and then having that work out for them. And they're a legitimate NFC contender, even at a 500 team. And I do think that Tom Brady is messing with karma here. He's really testing because the football gods have given him so much. They've given him Wilson's interception. They've given him a 28-3 lead blown by another team. They have handed him a lot. Uh, Several cheating scandals that go under the radar in his history. (laughs) And he's still complaining about being in the NFL. That is going to mess with you. That's not a good decision. So I, yeah, and I he feel chose like, to um, come back. Like that's that's the thing that baffles yeah. everybody. Is that he chose to come back. You you got out, man. You stayed out. You got yeah. out and left for forty five days. And like, you know what? I can't take it. I got to do it. And now you're complaining about your own decision, man. That's yeah. That's some bad. That's some bad karma coming your way. Uh, rehash or reconfiguring my answer to go for this year. You got to feel like the Raiders have bad karma. And they tested they tested those bad waters by bringing in a guy who had previously not worked out in Denver and had signed on or agreed to become the Colts coach. And then, what, a week later, he's like, mm, nah, I'm out. I don't want to actually do this. I want to stay in New England because I don't like your situation. It's like, that's not a guy you want to trust with your franchise. And then you hand Derek Carr, what, the $200 million contract. You you uh, trade a bunch of picks for Devontae Adams and and it hasn't worked out. I get they had to make a decision after getting rid of John Gruden, but was was Josh McDaniels really the guy you wanted to go with after his past? The Gruden curse, maybe. Oh, yeah. Um, just being a generally bad dude. <laughs> yes. Maybe that could be. And I don't know. I don't know what Denver did, what kind of monkey paw somebody uh, <laughs> left behind there, but that is a complete disaster because it's not going to get better. It oh. will not get better. It's very much like the end of Donovan McNabb, except for it's $230 million. It's not just like, oh, they signed him to a one-year contract. They gave up draft capital. At this point, I mean, the Seattle Seahawks are going to draft higher with Denver's pick than they are with their own and get better quarterback play out of Geno Smith. Wow. Yeah. That's a team that's that's got uh, good karma. That's in the good karma camp. They got rid of the guy who has has just weird vibes around him and Russell Wilson. And you heard how, uh, who was it? Uh, Richard Sherman and uh, yeah. Marshawn Lynch talked Marshawn, about him yeah. on their podcast. It's like, ooh, those two guys aren't like, obviously they're not shy of talking about people like that. But when they're coming out and saying that about the quarterback who got who helped them get a Super Bowl, like that obviously doesn't speak good about what he is or how he is, how he handles himself behind the scenes. So yeah, you got rid of Seattle getting rid of the guy with the weird vibes and going with Geno Smith, bringing him back after what almost eight years of not starting a NFL game and they're getting great football play or quarterback play out of him. Yeah. That's, that's a team with good, good karma right now. Good, good vibes from the Seahawks for sure. Okay. Uh, on to our next question. Speaking of Geno Smith, Marcus Mariota and Geno Smith got wins to keep their teams at 500, which is pretty good considering both of them are supposed to just be gap fillers, Mariota and Smith. And now both of those teams can compete for the playoffs. Um, so 
that's it's pretty cool that they're getting second chances. M- Mariota, I mean, he had some struggles in Tennessee, but you do wonder if they had kept him and not gotten Ryan Tannehill, if that team would have been just strong enough after they kept him to go places with Mariota, but he ends up as a backup. Now he's getting his chance to prove that he deserves to be a starter. As you mentioned with Geno Smith, quarterbacks can develop sometimes, and he's always had a good arm, but man, he has made some great throws this year. I want to know from you some quarterbacks who you always thought deserved a second chance, but never got it. Guys that were just deemed busts or didn't work out somewhere and then disappeared. I'll start off with the one that kind of, uh, my my uh, honorable mention, it's the quarterbacks who were thought of highly coming out of college. And this mainly started with Matt Leinart because that USC team in the mid-2000s was when I was in high school and I loved watching college football back then. And that team was just awesome to watch. They were so dynamic. And you wanted to see Matt Leinart succeed in the NFL. It just never worked out because he got the last year of Dennis Green and then had Ken Wisenhunt as his head coach for a couple of years because he's supposedly a genius because he had Philip Rivers as his quarterback, I believe, if I'm remembering timelines correctly. Um, and you just, I kind of want to see guys like that who were drafted highly, thought of highly, and just never, never succeeded. So like Matt Leiner, Jake Locker, David Carr, those guys who were placed in bad situations, give them good situations and see if they can develop into something reasonable for a quarterback. But my one that I would really want to go with, and this is going back to the Madden talk, a quarterback I loved drafting or trading for back in the late 2000 or late, early uh, 2010s, Seneca Wallace. Let me let I loved trading for him on Madden because he was just so fun to use. Let me take him out of that time frame of football and bring him into this time frame of football when we're more accepting of dual threat quarterbacks, guys who can run and create space and uh, basically create plays just by you know running around and creating opportunities for his for his wide receivers to get open. I want to see what he could do in today's NFL. It might not it may not work out because he really wasn't the most accurate quarterback in college and in the NFL. So it may not work out, but I would love to see it. Now, if you're talking about spinning a quarterback from the past to the future, Cordell Stewart is always my answer for that because what an unbelievable athlete who could throw the ball, but they were putting him in such a traditional offense that I think it was tough for him to operate. He did get a second chance with Chicago. That did not go very well. Mm -hmm. So some of these guys did get second chances that didn't turn out very well. Uh, but one of my favorite stories for all backup quarterbacks, and it's similar to Geno Smith, is Todd Collins. Now, if folks don't know anything about Todd Collins, well, you shouldn't really. Like, maybe you've heard of him <laughs> a little bit. But listen to how crazy this is with Todd Collins. So he was drafted to be Jim Kelly's replacement, okay? And he came in in, in 96 a couple times, Jim Kelly's last year won a couple games, was okay, and then got one season starting in 1997. Then the Bills went out and got Doug Flutie, and the rest is history there, but they moved on from Collins pretty quickly. He served as the backup quarterback in Kansas City from 01 to 05 and literally never played, never started a game. Then went to Washington at 35 years old, didn't play a game. Comes in in 2007 at 36 years old. Wins three straight games, five touchdowns, no picks, 106 quarterback rating, and gets Washington into the playoffs after not playing, not starting a game from 97 to 07 and won three games. Like that was that was some Geno Smith stuff. So that was a guy who I always thought was a, a gifted quarterback and a big arm. And it just was sort of unfair. Like he just didn't get much of an opportunity started once. And that was it. So that's taking you way back. I always wondered about Joey Harrington. He had about the worst situations in the entire world um, for him. There's a few other guys that are kind of like that, where you just wonder if it wasn't so bad for Akili Smith or something. Right. And I also don't think, and I'll check on this real quick that Byron Leftwich ever got another chance to start. I liked I Byron so. Leftwich. I didn't think he was a great quarterback, but he never got another chance after Jacksonville. Yeah, that's right. So after Jacksonville, he played a couple of games in relief for Tampa Bay and then ended his career as a backup. So he pretty much only got a couple of seasons, won some games, had some decent stats, and then never got another chance again. Never understood that for Byron Leftwich. David Garrard was kind of the same way in the same from the same team. Like won some games for Jacksonville 
decent quarterback play for the time, but just never got an opportunity afterward. Yeah, he was 32 when he left the, the Jaguars, but the guy who was winning eight games – pretty much on the regular for a Jaguars team at the time that wasn't really that good. I mean, the guy deserved a second chance. At least something from somebody to be a filler. And I'll give you my last one here. And this guy is known as the greatest bust of all time. And that is Jamarcus Russell. Mm -hmm. But if you go look, there were stories as recent as maybe like five years ago that Jamarcus Russell was working with a quarterback coach that he had completely cleaned up some of his uh, issues with – uh, you know, the purple drank type of yeah. thing, which is really bad for you uh, and had grown up and he was putting it out there. Like somebody give me another chance. And I'm surprised that no one had him in for a workout. I mean, that would have been one of the coolest stories ever in the NFL. A guy completely flames out of the league as a young man. He is known as the biggest bust ever and then shows up and just, succeeds you know like that i don't know i think that would have been that would that's have been hollywood, such a interesting story. story type thing yeah that would have been such an interesting story but no one ever gave him another chance i'm not blaming them that position you know deserves a lot of or always garners a lot of attention and needs yeah. a lot of work and whatever else and if and i'm sure that if jamarcus russell is your backup or something then everybody's going to have jamarcus russell questions all the time you don't want that but kind of reminds me in a, in a weird way of like Randall Cunningham coming back. Um, not that he was a bust. He was an incredible quarterback, but just a guy who's out of the league kind of done. Maybe his reputation isn't the best at the end and then totally changes that. I don't know. I kind of wish someone had given Jamarcus another chance. Um, next question for you, which one of these early season narratives is being overstated Bad referees quarterbacks being washed or the number of bad teams and bad games, which we opened the show discussing. So I don't know if you're picking that one, but maybe you are. What? Which one of those narratives is overplayed? I am not going to say the number of bad teams, bad games is overplayed because we've been talking about this for years, that there's just a lot of bad football on a Sunday. And it gets people, the NFL gets away with it by broadcasting NFL Red Zone and that being so popular. People only see the highlights and that's kind of what this this generation, my my generate or our generation and younger kind of want to see is just the highlights. They don't really care for the whole game. So the NFL is getting away with a lot of bad football because there's not a lot of people watching full football games these days. They're watching red zone and stuff like that. Uh, so I'm not going to say that one. It's really hard to say that bad refer bad refereeing is overstated because it's not. I mean, bad refereeing has been an issue, a chronic issue for this league for a while now, even before the replacement refs made it look like it was like, like we had good refereeing for a while. Uh, so I'm going to try and make an argument for quarterbacks being washed is overstated. Uh, and this is my best attempt at it. I don't think they're washed other than Matt Ryan. He's totally washed and that sucks because I like him. Uh, I think they they just regressed. So now they're just good quarterbacks. They're not like the all-star world, all world quarterbacks that we used to see, but that's expo exposing the flaws of the team's builds that they're on. You got the Bucks O-line is brutal and, and it's being exposed that Tom Brady's not able to play like he used to. He's probably, I don't know if they're, I don't know what the stats are on it, but he, I don't, I can't imagine he's getting the ball out as quick as Tom Brady used to. And I know that offensive linemen for the Patriots used to get massive contracts elsewhere because they looked good with Tom Brady as their quarterback, because he's so good at getting that ball, getting the ball out quickly. Packers over reliance on Rodgers and getting them out of just about everything is not helping them. And then the poor system installed around Russell Wilson is making that not look good. And that might just be him not being that great of a quarterback and not being a, the greatest of leaders and kind of ruining that locker room a little bit. But I think it's just these quarterbacks that we thought were the greatest of all times have regressed to being good and it's expo it's exposing the team's flaws. Yeah. I think that that's a decent argument to make. Uh, Rogers and Brady are still graded by PFF in the top 10 quarterbacks this year. That is trying to separate their play from other people around them. But I do think that uh, there are some washed quarterbacks. I yeah. mean, Ryan played his best game, so maybe there's a, a flicker of hope there. <laughs> Stafford and Wilson, though, I don't know. I think they both. I think they're both old and have a lot of injuries. And Stafford got beat up in route to the Super Bowl last year. Um, and I mean, you play that many football games, you're talking about an, an added game, and then having to play Wild Card Weekend all the way through. Uh, that's going to take its toll. He's never been the healthiest guys to begin with. He's That's exactly right. 
Yeah, he is not a guy that screams, I play till 42 years old, yes. for sure. So I do think that maybe there's a little, it's a little overstated, but probably also has a lot of truth to it. I think that the refereeing is not any different. What I think is, if you go back and look at a game, say in like 98, you're going to be like, what? <laughs> what is right. going on? on like this refereeing is crazy bad and there weren't reviews for a a good section of years in the nineties. Like, what is this? Like, it's so bad. There's a, there's an NFC championship game. There's a divisional round might be divisional round between the Packers and the 49ers where Jerry Rice blatantly fumbles the ball. I mean, blatantly catch running fumbles. And they're like, no fumble. I mean, it's just like, what? It's the all-star treatment. It's yeah. I mean, it was just one, it's one of, and it changed history because Steve Young went down and made the the famous throw to Terrell Owens. And it's like, that should never have happened. So if you look back in the day, there was one time where the referees were debating a call and it accidentally was picked up by the TV mics where they said, just give it to him. And (laughs) Wade Phillips pulled his team off the field. They can go look this up pull this team off the field and the Patriots kicked the extra point with no one on the field because that, because it was such an egregious call that cost them the game. So I think that it's probably never, uh, you know, it hasn't changed a ton in recent years, more or less. We just really focus on it. And I saw like, even there, there was a stat about roughing the passers, how there's less this year than there even was last year. It's just that there's been some very noticeable ones. Mm-hmm. Um, let's, uh, for time's sake, we can move on here to our final two questions real quick. Uh, I just uh, want to know how many of these teams that are right now the top eight in the NFL draft are going to pick quarterbacks, Carolina, Vegas, Detroit, Houston, Houston, not a typo. Houston has two top five picks right now. Philly, Pittsburgh, Arizona. How many of those teams will pick quarterbacks in next year's draft? I think the easy ones we can take off the board here, Carolina, Detroit, Houston. Those guys are automatically going to draft a quarterback. My real question comes with Las Vegas. I know they just handed Derek Carr a massive contract. Hasn't worked out there. Does Josh McDaniels think, all right, I've had enough of this. Let's try and figure out a way to move him. Maybe they can find a way to move that contract to a team that thinks they can, they can get something out of Derek Carr. Uh, that Josh McDaniels wasn't, and does he go for one of these stud quarterbacks that are going to be at the top of the draft? It it screams to me a Josh McDaniels, Patriots way type of thinking that, all right, this guy's not working for me. I'm going to be able to move him out of here and get my rookie quarterback, and this is how it's going to work. I mean, he he's the guy who drafted Tim Tebow thinking he could make him work back in the day. So that screams to me, uh, or Josh McDaniels screams to me, a guy who's who, who thinks he can do that again and try and move on from the contract that he just dished out to Derek Carr. Also, Philly is not a typo either. I believe that's a trade with maybe New Orleans Isn't it Miami or Miami. Yeah. My, whoever it is, but yeah, they're in the top eight also. That might be Miami. Um, so that's crazy that yeah. Philadelphia is the best team in the NFC and it has a high draft pick at this moment. You are a hundred percent right. Carolina will take, it's gotta be Bryce young. Yeah. Pretty much has to be. Uh, as the number one overall pick, I suppose it could be CJ Stroud. I'm very intrigued by Anthony Richardson, but, uh, okay. So there's one for sure. I like your argument on Vegas that they will possibly trade Derek Carr, draft a quarterback. Detroit has to do it. Jared Goff is okay, but not good enough. Houston has to do it. They have nothing. Pittsburgh is a probably not. They'll probably stick with Kenny Pickett for at least two years. That might be a mistake. I guess we'll find out. The intriguing one here is Arizona yeah, because it is just not working between Cliff Kingsbury and Kyler Murray. And they just signed Cliff Kingsbury to a long-term deal. Now, is there somebody out there in the national football league who would be willing to say we can get more out of Kyler Murray? And my guess is, yeah, because he played like, and he played like an MVP for half of last season. And then all of a sudden it was like someone turned the water off. Uh, but I think it's that their coach might be clueless. And I also think their GM is clueless. They completely failed to take advantage of a rookie quarterback contract with Kyler Murray. Now he's going to be expensive, but if you're a team that's up and coming and is really good, I mean, you should try to trade for him, right. Uh, and put him in a little better circumstance, coach a little better. And I think we've seen some high end enough 
for that to be an interesting idea. And they could just be like, yeah, Kyler has been playing too many video games again. We're drafting somebody else. I could see it. I could see them turning the blame on the quarterback because they put it out there about that whole, he's got a study thing in his contract to make sure that they had plausible deniability. If this did not go well, we all know why they did that. There's a new call of duty coming out and there's definitely going to be bonus XP weekends coming up that he's going to take advantage of. I mean, <laughs> Hey, video game addiction is a real thing. I'm just Absolutely saying it is. is, it is a real thing. By the way, looking up Derek Carr's cap numbers on over the cap. If I'm reading this correctly, his contract is pretty super tradable after this year. Like, yep, that's no, correct. And they made it that no way. guaranteed money after yep. this year. So then the cap hit is very minimal. Uh, five, 5.6 million. If they trade him before trade or cut him before June 1st. So that is, a very tradable contract that they can just get out of. Okay. So initially I had asked for you to come up with three trades in our final question, just for time's sake, give me your favorite one. The trade deadline is coming up, but here's the way you do it. It doesn't matter if it's realistic. You have to make it make sense, but it doesn't have to be realistic trade player for player in the NFL. What's one deal you would do if you could just madden this thing turn the salary cap situation off and just go boop. This player goes there. That player goes there. Give me Christian McCaffrey in the Buffalo bills offense. I want to see what he can do with Josh Allen, Stefan Diggs, all the offensive talent they have there. Give, give Buffalo an actual good running back and let's see what happens there. I know running backs are kind of uh, their importance on the game has waned, but gives give Buffalo someone that much of a dual threat. And I want to see what happens, especially in a year where they're all in everybody's all in on Buffalo and give them another weapon and see how they can go head to head even, even more against Kansas city chiefs. Now that they have another weapon that teams will struggle to shut down. You got to keep McCaffrey healthy, but it it's not going to happen because Carolina want first round picks for a running back and no team in real life is ever going to trade that. So that would be something that only happens in Madden. Yeah, no, you're right about that. And uh, we'll see if they bend far away from that to move yeah. McCaffrey. I mean, Signing quarterback or uh, running backs to big contracts, never a particularly good idea. Uh, I think that I'd love to take Terry McLaurin off the pathetic Washington <laughs> football team. Yes. And I got like seven teams I could give him to. I was kind of <laughs> yes. like, well, let's see, you know, uh, the Packers could use a receiver, uh, you know, Atlanta, maybe how about Tom Brady's having trouble keeping his receivers healthy I mean, there's, there's lots of places that, that I could send them, but I'll give you one. I would love to help Trevor Lawrence even a little bit more. I think his supporting cast is okay, mm -hmm. but what it's been revealed in recent weeks, it's not great still in, in Jacksonville. They've shown signs, but I want Jacksonville to be a thing again. So Terry McLaurin, go down there, play with Christian Kirk, make that a nice little receiver duo and give, give Terry McLaurin his credit. The guy is a really, really good player. And he just has had so many miserable quarterbacks throwing him the ball in his history. Uh, he's kind of the new Allen Robinson in a lot of ways. Yeah. Now Robinson finally has a decent quarterback. That quarterback's broken and Robinson can't play anymore. Yes. I just very, very unfortunate, but I want to send scary Terry somewhere nice uh, <laughs> at the trade deadline. They won't do it. They just signed him. So it's like not realistic, but like, that's a player who deserves better. I think uh, we all just want to see Trevor Lawrence succeed now. I mean, well, I, yeah, I mean, I think good. he's a really talented player. Yeah. And like you, every you week he makes what like... happened to him last year again with urban Meyer. Like everyone hated seeing one of the most gifted college quarterbacks of all time go in there and be given just this dead weight of a court of a head coach and just drag him down for a year and kind of ruin his reputation. Everybody just kind of wants to see him succeed. And I'm totally on that bandwagon wanting to see Trevor Lawrence succeed and have their head coach do well, despite uh, after getting canned by Philadelphia five bucks. If you can name their leading receiver in Jacksonville this year, who is it? Ooh. Uh, it? Christian Kirk's too obvious, right? It's not Christian Kirk. Nope. I can't name him. <laughs> no, I know. Can't. Isn't that the problem? <laughs> yes. <laughs> he needs a good receiver like that. They didn't overpay for is Zay Jones. The only reason I know him is because I love playing the Raiders on Madden. And he yeah. used to be on the Raiders. So he did used to be on the Raiders and was not good there and was not good in Buffalo and ain't good here. No. He's averaging eight yards a catch Zay Jones. I mean, uh, yeah, he could still continue to use some help. So anyway, another very, very fun 
Hot Routes episode. Thank you so much for your time, Jonathan, and for everybody who has joined on with uh, our Hot Routes parties um, from various different places. Really appreciate it. We do it once a week, every week, recapping the previous week and getting down random rabbit holes like Jamarcus Russell and Jumbo Elliott. So don't, didn't this pay off for everybody? I think it did. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> when you get a Jumbo Elliott reference, it absolutely pays off. I was very proud of it. Uh, okay. Well, thanks for listening, everybody. And we will catch you next time.